Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to check out running Linux on the Retroid Pocket Mini. Now by default this is an Android based handheld, so all the reviewing and testing that I've done so far has been within that environment. However, one of the unique things about the Snapdragon 865 which is used in this handheld is that it does have Linux support. And so in this video we're going to try out test builds of two different Linux firmwares, both Botticera as well as Rocknix. And these are both launched from the SD card, which means that you can still run Android on the internal storage and then pop in one of these SD cards to run Linux. And there are some advantages to running Linux like this. It's going to be a much easier setup process compared to configuring all those emulators in Android. And you have additional gaming options within Linux, including the original Xbox, as well as native Pico 8 and Portmaster. So anyway, we're going to go through the process of getting this set up on your SD card, and then I'm also going to show you a bunch of gameplay and how it looks. And just bear in mind, these are early test builds, so they do have a few bugs here and there. Either way, I'm super excited to get into this. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, let's start by talking about the two Linux-based operating systems we're going to try out here today. The first is Botticera. This has been around for quite some time. It's available on PC and Steam Deck and Raspberry Pi and even other handhelds. And when Retroid first announced that they were coming out with the Retroid Pocket Mini and the Retroid Pocket 5, they talked about launching it with Botticera. And at first it looked to be a custom build made by that team, but it does look like the Botticera team is working on it as well. In fact, on their GitHub page, they've got a work-in-progress ticket. And here at the bottom is where I found a link for a public test build. And so this is the Botticera version we're testing here today. It's officially from the team, but still a work in progress. And I'll leave a link to this page down below. Now the next option is Rocknix, which was originally a fork of Jealous. Now Jealous and Rocknix have been around for years as well, but they're more focused on the cheaper or lower powered devices. And so often you'll find devices from Ambernick and Powkitty are the ones that they support. And the test build that I'm using for this video is actually sent over to me from the lead developer. And so I don't think there's a public build for it just yet. And so I would also very much so consider this one to be a work in progress. Now to set this up you just flash an image to an SD card and then you will put it inside your Retroid Pocket while it is running Android. From there press and hold the power button until you get the power menu. Next, tap on that restart option, and as soon as you do, press on the volume up button and hold it. This will do a power cycle of the device, and as soon as it boots up, it's going to go into what they call U-Boot. And this will give you a bunch of options in very small text, and all you really have to do is just choose the second option. And to get to that, you just need to press on volume down, and then the power button to confirm. And that essentially is telling the device to boot from the SD card instead of the internal storage where Android is. That will start the installation process for Botticera, and you'll be good to go. Now theoretically, to get to the U-Boot menu, you should be able to press and hold the volume up button and then the power button, but I found that that process would boot me into Android every time, and so the only way I could get a workaround was to actually restart it from within Android while holding volume up. Either way, that's the process at least right now to boot into the SD card. And we should be seeing some future firmware updates from Retroid that will allow us to actually choose to boot from the SD card every time if we would like. Either way, once the installation process is done, we'll be booted into that custom firmware, in this case, Botticera. Now, by default, Botticera already has a couple games loaded up into the operating system. These are freeware games that they use with permission to basically just showcase the firmware. But of course, at this point, we want to load our own game. So let me show you how to do that next. Now, these two images are Linux based and they do not have Windows friendly partitions. So we are going to have to transfer our games over the network. And it's actually pretty easy with both OSs. There are instructions on their websites on how to do this. But let me show you really quickly how I set it up with Botticera. So here on my Windows PC, I've opened up an Explorer window. From there, just go into the navigation bar up top and hit backslash backslash and then type in Botticera. Once you press enter, it's going to ask you for some network network credentials and you don't actually really need any. So just for your username, type the word guest and then nothing for the password and hit OK. And that'll give you access to the network share within Botticera on your Retroid Pocket Mini. And within the share partition, you're going to see a bunch of really important folders, including BIOS and ROM. And you've probably already figured it out, but at this point you just need to drag and drop your files from your PC over the network to your Retroid Pocket Mini via Botticera. So here's my setup. On the left side I've got my Botticera ROMs folder, and then on the right side I've got my external hard drive with all my games. And one note, as you start moving over your games you will find immediately that the transfer process is going to be relatively slow. To give you an idea of how long it took for me, it was about 6 hours to load up both SD cards with enough games to do testing for the rest of this video. And so transferring 
over your game library, especially if you have larger files, might take quite some time, just kind of bear with that. And don't forget to move over the BIOS files for some of those high-end systems as well. I'm not going to go into detail about which files go where and all that, you can find all that information on the wiki pages for both Rocknix and Botticera. But in a nutshell, that's how you flash an SD card, boot it into the card itself, and then load up your operating system. So here I am several hours later after I've loaded up all of my games into Botticera. And in terms of functionality within this operating system, it works exactly like you may expect. So we can navigate through our games and then pick them and then launch them. It's all a very simple process. One of the nice things about Botticera is that we have a number of different themes that we can download directly onto the device. And many of these can change the overall look and feel of your experience, so I do recommend experimenting with these. Just bear in mind that some of these themes were made with a 16x9 screen instead of a 4x3 one like we have here on the Retroid Pocket Mini. And so there may be some themes that just look a little bit squished. So before we jump into testing, let's talk a little bit about my new Retroid Pocket Mini right here. This is the orange model that I purchased as a pre-order right when it first launched. And you might have heard about this already, but the front of the shell was supposed to be white, but they accidentally made a bunch of gray ones. And many of these devices, including mine, shipped before they noticed the error. Now from here on out, they will have white faces on them, but if you did get a gray model like I did, you can actually exchange it if you would like. Or if you got a gray model and you want to keep it, you can actually just contact them, they'll give you a $15 refund. I'm still deciding whether or not I want to keep this one or exchange it for the white and orange one that I originally thought I was getting. But to be honest, the gray and orange color scheme, even though it wasn't what I was expecting, is kind of growing on me. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think that the gray or the white is going to look better? Okay, now let's jump into game testing. We'll focus on Botticera first, and then we'll do Rocknex after. And one thing to keep in mind with Botticera is that many of the heavyweight emulators are not even available on this build. Basically everything up through Dreamcast is here, but nothing after that. So that means that right now we don't have PS2 or GameCube or Wii U or Xbox, any of those things that you often will find on Botticera, they're just not on this build just yet. And I'm not 100% sure whether or not they're going to be added on later, but this device definitely has the power for it, so I hope to see it. Either way, let's talk about the gaming experience as it is right now with this test build. When it comes to the lightweight systems, you know, all your Game Boys and whatnot, everything plays just fine here. There were a couple issues, for example, the audio quality doesn't seem to be 100%, but in terms of just overall getting in and out of your games, it seems to be very similar to what you would expect from Botticera. And it's also a similar situation when it comes to all the home console systems all the way up to the 16-bit era. All these games play fine, and the great thing about it is I didn't have to install any emulators. Other than just flashing that SD card, all I had to do at that point was just drag and drop my games. So that's definitely one of the perks of having these Linux-based operating systems is that they're already pre-installed and pre-configured. Moving on, let's try out Arcade with MAME 2003 Plus, and I found that this one worked fine. In fact, even the harder to run arcade games like Killer Instinct ran at full speed. Now moving into the 3D-based systems, we'll start with PS1, and here I'm running these games at a 2x or a high resolution setting. And as expected, everything played beautifully. I also tested out Nintendo 64 using the default emulator, which is a standalone version of Mupin 64. This one ran well, but it has limited emulator options, so I wasn't able to see the frames per second, and I also was not able to upscale. Either way, every game that I was playing felt like it was at full speed, even 007 Goldeneye. So it does look like Nintendo 64 is pretty good on here as well. Now unfortunately, Sega Saturn crashed on me every time. I double-checked I had the right BIOS files and everything, but unfortunately it just wasn't working. So really the last system that I was able to test was Sega Dreamcast. Now thankfully this one does run with the Flycast core, which means I was able to go into the emulator options and upscale it to a 1280x960. That's going to be a perfect fit for the resolution of the Retroid Pocket Mini screen, and so everything looks beautiful. In addition, almost every single game that I played had zero issues whatsoever, and so I think this will be a pretty good Dreamcast machine. The only game where I felt a little bit of stuttering was with Res, and this is a rhythm-based game, and so you can definitely feel when there's a problem here. And I don't really think it was a performance issue, but just rather there were some glitches here and there that gave me some stutters. But even taking this game into account, I think that most everything up through Dreamcast is going to be very playable here, even on this test build of Botticera. And one last thing of note about this OS is that it does support a touchscreen input. This can be used while navigating through the main menu, and it'll also be used if and when they import something like like Nintendo 3DS. 
Okay, so now let's talk about Rocknix, and it's the exact same process here. I flashed it to an SD card, put it in my device, and then I restarted the machine within Android and then pressed volume up as soon as the restart process started. From there, it opened up that U-boot menu. I navigated down to the second option, pressed the power button to start it, and from there, it began the installation process of Rocknix. Now, like I mentioned before, this is a work in progress. For example, this particular build did not have audio patched in, and so I was not able to hear game audio, but the developer said that they have a fix for that already. Already, they just didn't patch it with this particular build. Either way, I want to test out what we have here, and setting up everything was exactly the same. So I just transferred everything over the network, and then I had all my games to test with. And again, if you have any questions about getting it set up, I would recommend checking out that Rocknex wiki. It is pretty easy. Now, because a lot of the high-end emulators do work on this one, we're going to focus on that, but I did test a couple before that. So, for example, with Nintendo 64, I was able to boot it into RetroArch, and I was able to upscale it as well to 1280x960. And every game that I played worked perfectly fine, so this is going to be great for Nintendo 64. Same thing with Dreamcast, upscaled to a 960p, and again, all the games were playing great. And so those two systems, no problem whatsoever on Rocknex. And I was happy to see that Sega Saturn was also booting, so I was able to play these games too. Now for this, I use the Beetle Saturn Core, which is the one I prefer. It's going to be a lot more accurate of a course, so it feels more like you're playing a real Sega Saturn, but it is very demanding and also is not able to upscale, so this is going to be at a native resolution. Even then, when playing the hardest to play games that I usually will test on Sega Saturn, these played absolutely fine. So I do think that this will be a very capable way of playing Sega Saturn with high accuracy here within Linux. Next up, I tried out GameCube, and the experience here was rather limited. This is running the standalone version of Dolphin, but unfortunately there are no hotkeys to get into the menu to make any sort of adjustments mid-game. And so everything here is played at the default settings. For example, I'm not sure if this is OpenGL or Vulkan, and this is also at a native resolution. Either way, I found that quite a few games were playing fine, including things like Super Monkey Ball 2, as well as NBA Street Volume 2. But for other games, I did see some issues. For example, with Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3, the graphics, like the text itself, was really wonky, and so there's some sort of graphical glitch happening here. I also found that some games would crash. For example, I tried to play Rogue Squadron 2, but I couldn't get past the front menu. And I also was not able to bring up the frames per second on screen, so I'm not sure if these games are playing at full speed, although most did play pretty smoothly. Beyond Good and Evil is a good test game, because this one, even at the very beginning, is very demanding. And even though I didn't have the audio to give me any sort of clues, it did feel like this was just a little bit slower than normal. So if anything, I would say that GameCube shows a lot of promise, at least on Rocknix, but there is still some work to be done. Okay, now let's move over to PlayStation 2. This one's a little bit easier to work with. For example, I was able to get into the menu and turn it on the Vulkan backend, and then also I was able to put on the on-screen graphics. I also gave it a 2x upscale, which is going to be very close to the 960p resolution of this display. And I found that for most games, this was a set-and-forget kind of situation. Once I had set it up with those configurations, I was able to play most games at full speed, even the harder-to-play ones like God of War 2 and Midnight Club 3. So already, this is very exciting. We've never actually had a Linux-based handheld that could play up to PS2 reliably. And so even with this test build, I think it shows a lot of promise of what we can do on the high end with this chipset in particular. Now that being said, I do have a couple caveats. The first is that not every single game played at full speed. For example, with the first Sly Cooper, even at a native resolution, I was seeing some slowdown. And also bear in mind, this is using the ARM Linux version of Aether SX2, which has stopped development. And so development on this emulator in particular will probably not improve. And so when it comes to PlayStation 2, this is kind of a what-you-see-is-what-you-get situation. Thankfully, most games were playing at a 2x resolution, which means that, yeah, I think this is actually going to be a pretty decent PS2 machine here on Linux. And of course, keep in mind that we are going to be dual booting with Android as well. So if there's a particular game that you want to play and it's not running in Linux, you might be able to try it out on Android instead. Okay, moving on, let's talk about Nintendo 3DS. And of note, Rocknix also has touchscreen input. So as you can see here with Harvest Moon 3, I was able to navigate through the menus by tapping on the screen. However, one thing of note, the 3DS emulator they have set up by default doesn't seem to have any hotkeys. So for example, by default it shows the two screens side by side, and I couldn't find any way to cycle through those screen layouts. And so this may limit the type of games you want to play on 3DS. For example, I'd love to see just a single screen for certain games, but I wasn't able to figure that out. Either way, the games that I did test ran well, they were just really hard to see. 
So now let's talk about some games that we can play on Linux that we cannot on Android. We'll start with the original Xbox because I think this is probably one of the biggest draws with these Linux-based firmwares. Now this is running the Linux-based version of Zemu and it's running at a native resolution, but you can still get into the settings and make changes if you would like. But of note, I did find a lot of slowdown when trying to play these original Xbox games. Now, like I mentioned before, I didn't have any audio cues and I also couldn't bring up the frames per second, but even then I could just feel that these games were running at a lower speed than normal. And that also included some of the more lightweight games. Things like Crazy Taxi 3 will generally run pretty well. However, I found that on the Retroid Pocket Mini, it just wasn't up to speed. And there were games that had graphical issues which would render them unplayable. So in the end, it was a bit of a roller coaster of emotions. It was super thrilling to be able to see games like Dead or Alive 3 running on a device that I expected to only play with Android. But sadly, it doesn't appear that the performance is there, at least right now with this test build. But on the bright side, let's talk about some other Linux-based things that we can do that we cannot on Android. Let's start with native Pico 8. This is something you can't run on Android unless you use something like a Windows wrapper. And the setup for this is super simple in something like Rocknix. You just have to move over your files from your Raspberry Pi and Linux versions of Pico 8. And from there, you can launch into Splore and navigate through using the internet to download and play games. Now, I probably wouldn't recommend buying a $200 device just to play Pico 8 natively like this. You can do it on much cheaper handhelds, but it's always nice to see an added bonus like this. Another thing that's working on Rocknix that you cannot find on Android is Portmaster. And this is a program I've made videos about before that gives you access to PC ports of many popular games. And the list here is huge. They're getting close to 700 games available right now. And setting up these games is very simple. You just download the container and patch files directly from Portmaster. And then if it's a commercial game, you just have to drag and drop your game data files from your PC version. And so this is going to be a great way to be able to play some lightweight PC games on the Retroid Pocket Mini. So this is pretty exciting as well. And so again, even though Portmaster is available on cheaper handhelds, it's awesome that we have this as an added bonus with the Retroid Pocket Mini. Okay, and that's really about it for this video. I wanted to show you the process of setting up an SD card and then booting into a Linux-based firmware on an Android device like the Retroid Pocket Mini. And this process should also work on the Retroid Pocket 5, which should be releasing here in the next couple weeks. And even though these firmwares are still early test builds and not ready for prime time, they show a lot of promise. I love the idea of having both an Android and a Linux device in the same handheld. It makes the Retroid Pocket Mini just that much more of a value. So let me know what you think about this whole dual boot experience experience in the comments down below. Is this something that you're going to try out on your Retroid Pocket Mini or Retroid Pocket 5? Or would you rather have dedicated handhelds for those two operating systems? As always, thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.